Hello fellow problem solvers, so today we're going to be doing a problem from the 2014 Junior Balkan Math Olympiad problem number 4. This is a beautiful problem from Combinatorix, quite lovely, it has a lot of moving parts, very good to practice your Combinatorix problem solving skills, which I, and I invite you to try this problem for a minimum of an hour, ideally two hours, but not more than three and a half hours. If, on the other hand, you'd like to go along with us, I suggest you take about 30 minutes and put your first ideas out on paper. So now, let's begin. So, this is a problem. We have n, an integer that's given, a positive integer that's given, and we have two players, a and b. a goes first. There are s stones in a pile, and they take turns, or they take one, a prime number, or n times t, stones where t is some positive integer and the question is with perfect play for how many values of s does a lose so if you just read the problem statement it looks like a very freaky problem like well you can take a prime number of stones and that's somehow what like what are you going to do with that like you don't know the distribution of primes how are you going to figure this out that's why i love this problem so the first thing to do problem solving strategies, the sort of problem solving philosophy is if the problem is difficult and you want to get a sense of the problem, you play around and you play around with small cases. So let's try, say, 4n equals 1. What do we have? I mean, a will always win because they can take s stones, like 1 times s stones at the beginning, and they win. Oh yes, the player who takes the last stone wins. So now with that, let's go on to n equals 2. And now let's see, for what values of s does a win or and for what values of s does b win? So for 1, a wins. For 2, a wins. Now what about for 3, huh? Well, 3 is prime, so a can just take 3 and win. Now for 4, we actually have a cannot win because if they take 1 stone, they go to 3, where they lose. They take 2, they go to 2, they lose. They take 3, they take, go to 3, they lose. Oh, but they can take four times two stones. So now, I mean, they can take four, like four is two times two, they can take four stones. So they can take like any, like six, eight, ten, they win. Like any multiple of two, they just take two times s, s over two times two stones, if s is a multiple of two and they win. But what if s, so five, it's a prime, they win. Seven, a prime, they win. Now nine, well, whatever number, if they think, an even number of stones, they'll go to one of these positions, where now the first player is B, and they can just win. And if they take a prime number of stones, they'll go to an even number, so B actually wins with 9. And this is an important concept, and I want you to pause for 5-10 minutes and sort of take this in, and maybe even try to push the problem further and understand what's going on here. And the concept is this, and this is common in game theory, like game sort of problems. And that's that there are starting positions where the player that starts, the first player wins, and there are losing positions where if the first player starts from that position, the second player wins, no matter what they do. Now, given this is like a kind of game where like at every po turn, at every point, like you just get a new number of stones and then you play from zero, basically. What it is saying is that to be able to win, you must be able to take your player, like take it from S stones to T stones, where T is a losing position, or zero. I mean, you can even say like zero is a losing position, because if you happen to like get zero stones, then you've already lost. Sort of by definition, it was like your turn and you got zero stones, which means you lost. So at every multiple of two, A was able to go down to zero stones, and at every odd number, they were able to take, go down to zero stones as well. And then nine was the first number where A could not go to zero no matter what. So now with that, I invite you now to play for n equals three and four and five and see if you get see any sort of pattern or any sort of idea comes up. And I invite you to do this, like I did this for at least 20 minutes back when I solved the problem, but at least 20, ideally 40 minutes playing around with this. And now here's the next step, next hint. So now, what you see for n equals 3 is that 0, 4, and 8 are positions where b wins, where the second player wins, where the first player loses. And the way we got to 4 is because we first like tried 1, it could go to 0, and then 4 couldn't go to 0, so it had to be on this side. And then 5, we were looking at this place right here, like 3k plus 2, 2 could go to 0, 5 could, 
8 could not go to 0 or 4, so it had to be here. I first made a mistake that it was 14, but actually 8 can't. And for n equals 4, we looked at 1, 2, 3, 4. All can go to 0, 5 can go to 0, and then 6 cannot, so it's here. And now we have all of these numbers can go to 6. And then for 7 can go to 0, 8 can go to 6, 9 can go to 6, and then 10 we skip, 11 goes to 0, 12 it can, yeah, it can go to zero, because, like all of these numbers also are done. Then 13 goes to zero, and then 15, it can't go to zero or six, because 15 minus six is nine, so 15 must go here. And then we go 17, 17 can go to zero, and then 21, it can't go to zero, six for 15, so it goes to this side. And now with this, a couple of ideas come to mind. Like the first thing is sort of like we need to look at all the remainders modulo n. Like all the numbers that are zero mod n will be able to go to zero. And we're looking at these sorts of positions. And it seems like here, like the reason why save some remainder r, like nk plus r, if none of the numbers of this form are losing for some r. That means that we can always take a prime number and go to some position which is a losing position. And we, can, we need to use, a, we can either use one or a prime number, but if k is large enough, then we'll need to use a prime number to get to one of the losing positions. And this sort of converse is to say like that we will always be able to do that. The intuition right now that we're building up is that the answer is n minus 1 and the, that we will always be able to do this. Like you play with 5 and 6 and you see that you're always able to do this. But now the question is, can we generalize? And here with these sorts of hints in mind, I invite you to pause for about 20 minutes, maybe even 40 minutes, but, and um, try to work with this problem. And now that you've done so, here's really like another way of looking at this thing because we can really finish with this. So. What is like, what do we know? We know that like due to this sort of like winning and losing positions that we can win in at most n minus one for b, n minus one like things outside of zero for b. So now let's assume we haven't won for that. Like we know it's going to be at most n minus one. And now let's prove that it actually is n minus one. So assuming for some n that it's not n minus one, what does it mean? There's some remainder r modulo and such that no matter like what the k, nk plus r is never, never a losing position. Now, what does that mean? Like if n is, if actually, if k is big, big enough, that means that we will never, like, first of all, we'll never subtract one, but it means we will always subtract a prime and go to another losing position, right? So, and this losing position is going to be of some other remainder. It's going to be n times l plus some t. At like for every k, and let's call this L, um, let's say it's LK and TK minus some k to prime. So what does that mean? Well, it means in other words, for like some TK other than R, but this is also obvious given like this, what type of prime this is. So what does this actually mean for us? Well, if you look at it another way, this is NK plus R minus and LK minus TK is always equal to some prime, some kth prime. Now I'm going to ask you if this is looking familiar to you. Minus some K minus LK, this is fixed and bounded, plus R minus TK, again, fixed and bounded, is equal to a kth prime. And now here with this hint, I invite you to pause for 10 to even 30 minutes and try to finish the problem. Because here's how you work with this hint. Note, that you have control over k, right? This is bounded and so is then k minus lk. Assuming, now let's just like write this down in a very nice way. So let's make k is equal to, hmm, how will we write this? Well, let's say it's the sum of all the possible l's. I mean, the whole thing is this sort of thing right here. What are its values? So the potential, like, what are the potential values? If you look at it, not as this, but some. So we have for every A that's congruent to R, there exists a losing position for A, for every A congruent to R, such that this is a prime. 
and now what we, what we, it would be enough for us if we found an A such that between A and A minus the biggest one, L that's the biggest like, like of all the losing positions, let's say it's the max of the losing positions, then such that in here, if we don't have a prime, if we pick such an A that's congruent to R modulo N, such that here we don't have a prime, we will get a contradiction. But now this isn't also way too difficult, we just need what? Say that the biggest one of the losing positions, like assuming the contrary, say the biggest one of the losing positions is some L, then we just look at the values. So what do we need? We need that a n, a n plus r, and not a n, like some k n plus r, and k plus one n plus r, like that this sort of thing, like between these two. Maybe, maybe if we just put, so this is always a difference between n. Okay, let's maybe think about how we're going to like actually do this. So what we're going to be making here is we're going to have like n factorial plus two all the way till n factorial plus n. And we must make sure that the a till a minus l is contained in here for some a that's congruent to r modulo n. So to get an a that's congruent to r modulo n, we would need at least, I believe, let me see what a, this is going to give us n minus one numbers. So we need n minus one to be at least say n to get at least one of them that's congruent to r and then to have this l we need at least plus l let's multiply this by two add ten and then i think we're safe with this type of n we're going to see that there's this many numbers we're going to take the biggest one that's congruent to r modulo n and then this number, like call it a, then a minus l will still be greater than n factorial plus two. And we'll be able to show this. So now I invite you here to actually take about 30 minutes and cut, like write up a solution because that's what we'll do next, combining all these ideas together. So the first thing we do is we define like what goodness and badness of s means. And we have this claim that s is good if and only if s minus p, s minus one, or s minus kn is bad for some prime p or positive integer k. Also noting that we call zero bad. And the proof here is simple enough. And now we move on to our like second claim, which is, so we prove that there are at most n minus one bad numbers. So if we do this, we assume there are more. Then we note that no number divisible by n is bad like other than zero, there are most n minus one bad numbers other than zero. And then what we say is that no, no number divisible by n is bad. So there would have to be two that are congruent to the same thing modulo n, assume these are n my n k plus r and n l plus r with k greater than l. And now we show by claim one, this is a blatant contradiction because we can get from n k plus r to n l plus r by just staking n times k minus l coins as uh, stones. And now with that, we go on to our third claim, which is, so the way we do this is by assuming the contrary, that there are exactly n minus one bad numbers other than zero. We assume there are less, we name them all b1 through bt, with t less than n minus one. And now by pigeonhole, there exists an r between one and n minus one, such that n doesn't divide r plus n times l, minus bi for all i and all l for all i between one and t. And now this means that all numbers of the form n l plus r must be good. And that means that for every single such number, there exists a prime p l such that n l plus r minus p l is bi for some i from one through t. Or that n l plus r minus one is equal to bi for some i one from one through t. And now with that, we move on to our like destruction and we say, and we figure this L out after a couple of tries. And now we, we get this L, we have, we define B to be the sum of all the BTs, BIs actually. And now we have NL plus R minus BI is equal to this. And this is obviously greater than one. And on the other hand, this whole thing right here is greater than one due to BN greater than B is greater than BI. And it's less than this thing right here, 
due to the fact that n plus b plus bi plus 1 is greater than r due to n greater than r. So that means that nl plus r minus bi can't be a prime or 1, which leads us to a contradiction. Also note that, and this is important to note in your proof, that even if there's this is empty, if t is 0, we are still done because like we've shown that if we take L to be, what will that be? 2n plus 1 factorial over n plus 1. Then what we would have is, we would have that. So it's 2n plus 1 factorial plus n, because this is 0, plus r minus nothing. Like Then this always has to be a prime for every single n for r equaling 1 through n minus 1 which is false. So even in this case, we are done. And this also, this shows that, like, so now we say that claims three and two show that the number of such s is n minus one, which solves our problem. And as always, thanks for problem solving.